Well, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, delighted to be uh, moderating this panel on the um, BBNJ process, and I think I'm inordinately excited about this, um, not because it's the final panel, but because um, I think as many of us are in this position of kind of watching this process from the outside and feeling like it's a little bit hard to understand what's going on, um, and I think we've got some really uh, wonderful people to help us understand uh, the kind of inside process. Um, so let me introduce people uh, briefly, and then I think we'll actually move in this direction. Um, so to my uh, immediate right, we have uh, uh, Ambassador Rolf Einer Fifa, uh, Norwegian ambassador to the European Union since January uh, of 2019. Uh, before that, Norway's ambassador to France, um, and he's had a variety of positions within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1985, including as legal advisor. And if you've had the chance to talk to him during the um, uh, during this conference, you will note that he's conversant and expert on a stunning range of issues, um, and so BB&J is, uh, is apparently one of them. Um, and then uh, uh, to his right is uh, David Freestone, uh, prof professorial lecturer and visiting scholar at the George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C., executive secretary of the Sargasso Sea Commission, um, and very much a celebrity in this world as, uh, in addition to those uh, functions, as the founding editor of the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law, uh, which is now in its, uh, in, in its 34th year, the author or editor of some 30 books and more than 200 academic articles, um, awarded the Elizabeth Haub Gold Medal for Environmental Law. Um, and then to his right is uh, Ambassador Rena Lee, um, who is the Ambassador for Oceans and Law of the Sea Issues and Special Envoy of the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Singapore, concurrently serving with the Hague Diplomatic Office of the Embassy of Singapore. Um, I hadn't realized how many hats you wear, um, and uh, I thought you had your hands full just with the BBNJ process, but, uh, but you have more, in fact. Um, she's worked on a variety of issues uh, surrounding the law of the sea, boundary delimitation, environmental law, human rights and privileges uh, and immunities. So it's a superb panel to uh, address this issue. And as Alexander mentioned, I think at the last session, we've had kind of appetizers along the way about BBNJ. Um, you know, Joanna's presentation, and so we've, we've gotten little glimpses, but now we really get to the to the main course in terms of what's going on. And so without further ado then, uh, maybe we would start with Ambassador uh, Fifa. Thank you so much. Um, brief word of thanks to uh, the Hamilton uh, Luger School, the Hamburg University and the uh, Tribunal for uh, this event and for inviting me. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd like to say that um, my focus will be on the question that is put in the title, Time for a Treaty, a New Treaty, and that may lead to, um, I will uh, share with you my personal reflections, not my official reflections, because right now I'm supposed to follow Brexit and uh, new commission in Brussels and a few other things. I'm not dealing with the BBNG, and uh, when I was asked, uh, would you like to speak about uh, BBNG, I thought it was BB Netanyahu and Jay Leno, but it's not. So I'm coming here to, to share with you some reflections of a Norwegian uh, based on um, uh, many, many years of uh, providing legal advice and uh, working on dispute resolution and constantly asking, do we need a new treaty here? Is it necessary? Is it useful? How do we do it? How can we promote international law in policy making and in other spheres? So thank you for this. And let me just uh, start by saying that um, I, 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 the basic messages I have are the following. One, we need rock-solid legal analysis. We need uh, razor-sharp tools of analysis in terms of international law. That's one prerequisite. Then we need to put law in context. We need to take in a frank assessment 
of all the facts, the developments, we touched upon technological developments, questions are what are the real issues? What are the problems? What are the causes? What are the possible remedies? And uh, I think the interaction between the first and the second is essential, and that's where we have a problem. Because uh, I don't think we ha are facing, uh, and we heard yesterday, and basically thanks to the organizers also for bringing in uh, the two fantastic representatives we listened to yesterday, um, representative of soft power, Shanana Guzmao, from a newly independent state, a very insp inspiring, and the representative uh, from the Secretary of Defense, from a superpower. And uh, the two were basically uh, providing uh, a powerful combined message of the importance of uh, international law to promote common interests and solve real problems uh, together. And we stand much stronger if we do so um, through multilateral systems and build on UNCLOS. Now, when all that is said and done, I don't think the planet has been more vulnerable than it is now and that we may, we, we may look at various uh, uh, chain reactions that will be emphasized by the disappearance of uh, ice that previously had been reflecting solar energy in the high north, now being, during summertime, absorbed by water masses and thereby changing dramatically the paradigm for our understanding not only issues concerning uh, currents and temperatures, but uh, the melting of the Greenland ice cap and a few other things. That's just one example. Another is the permafrost that may be uh, thawing to such an extent it may release methane that will again enter into the equation, trigger chain reactions, and we've not seen yet uh, the, uh, the potential consequences. The list is pretty lengthy of issues. At the same time, never has the multilateral system been as much questioned in reality and under attack as now. So the question is, what, um, what could we do to, um, to link the two and uh, prove the relevance of, uh, of um, UNCLOS international law, etc.? Now, there is a divide between those who talk the legal, use the legal jargon, can refer to Article 79 or 311 or whatever in the convention, and those who actually uh, make uh, decisions at different levels, decide where to put the money in terms of financing particular issues, deciding on legislation, uh, taking Coast Guard measures, uh, measures, whatever. I think the two need to be brought together. And just to say what I can bring to the fore here is, uh, first of all, a line of um, uh, basic, basic message of optimism. I think that as long as we can preserve the integrity of UNCLOS, that we can respect all the basic principles, and this is uh, reflected in the requirements, the strict requirements in Article 311 with regard to the um, conclusion of future agreements, the right criteria of compatibility. You cannot throw down the drain the issue of common heritage of mankind. There are quite a few principles you have to respect. The Convention on, the, on Bi Biological Diversity in 1992 has also strict requirements that need to be respected. Efficiency when it comes to measures to be, to, to be taken depends very much on utilizing the system. To me, this system, we have a, a, a major communication um, challenge in that lots of UNCLOS is to be compared with a standard operating system of a computer. The user doesn't, I don't know anything about operating systems of a computer. I use the apps, I use the software which might be linked to using the internet or sending e email messages or making an Excel spreadsheet, whatever. I don't know what is behind. Now, a lot of what we are considering is the usefulness of having added software or adding some powerful hardware to a standard operating system which is pretty fine-tuned to integrate different things civilian, military, environmental, industrial, and other activities. And this is the fantastic beauty of the package solution and the comprehensive ambition that the UNCLOS represents. I think we need to take that into full consideration. Now, I see very often 
despondency, people saying, well, um, this has been adopted, doesn't work. Half of the convention is not only a standard operating system, it's a program of work. It's, it's a series of provisions, not least in part 12, which basically empower states, regional organizations, and other international organizations to engage with the unique legitimacy and efficiency that UNCLOS may provide to actually fix some problems. I often hear that the IMO in London, the International Maritime Organization, is such an example, but it's, quote, not efficient because it depends on consensus, and uh, that's the minimum common denominator that applies, etc. However, I don't see the spectacular headlines I was expecting when the co Polar Code was adopted and entered into force on the 1st of January 2017. The, the dynamics behind were basically that we have revolutionized both the Safety of Life at Sea Convention and the MARPOL, the Mar 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 Pollution Convention, with a series, with a program of work which re will require certification of vessels of different kinds, with different kinds of tonnage, training for mar mariners, and basically will cover one possible aspect of what we talk about in terms of BB&J. It's not the answer to it, but it will cover areas also beyond national jurisdiction. Now, I hear people saying, been there, done that, the Polar Code has been adopted, nothing has happened. But the Polar Code is just a framework for a number of regulations to be adopted. When I visited those uh, uh, teams negotiating, I was struck by the fact that you had ship insurance people, maritime insurance people coming, uh, representatives of shipyards, various continents being interested. The list is quite lengthy of proof that this system is actually going to be important. It will affect profit making. It will prof uh, affect the paradigm of how you will navigate in, in certain areas. Now, another example of interaction where I personally have learned lots of humility and modesty is when being at the within or in the middle of the magnetic field of interaction between international lawyers and scientists, politicians, treasuries, etc. And I have a couple of examples. What I've learned is that it's pretty difficult to predict the future. We were discussing part 11 in UNCLOS, and we thought at the time that the only interesting thing was polymetallic nodules, since we discovered new things. One was discussing the outer limits of the continental, uh, continental shelf. Basically, the understanding of what the continental shelf is in terms of geology has been evolving since the convention entering into force. Nevertheless, the rules providing for determinacy of the outer limits of national, na national jurisdiction are pretty much applicable. Okay. I have a list of, of examples of possibilities my key message is that we should give effect to the existing rules. 192, the Article 192 of UNCLOS, we had references yesterday to how this reflects general principles that can be used in jurisprudence. I've myself been involved in interaction with the Coast Guard. We had one vessel out beyond 200 miles in areas which BB&J is going to, to cover where the idea was we are powerless because it's beyond 200 nautical miles, but the fact that it was basically carrying two flags at the same time intermittently, uh, the whole issue was provide evidence at the right moment, videotapes, radio communications, demonstrating that the ship was actually invoking two nationalities at the same time. You could assimilate a ship to a stateless vessel, and we acted accordingly. There are possibilities. Now, what is to us in Norway, and I think personally, the, the key message with regard to BB&J, it is if we can refine key needs, added value in particular areas. One, genetic, marine genetic resources. Let's be quite modest and humble about what that means in terms of potential and risks. Let's make sure that we don't try to regulate too narrowly, 
to strictly and probably immodestly on what this is all about. Let's just make sure that we cover that as broadly as we can. Secondly, make sure that you can promote sustainable use, because unless you engage the most relevant resources in the world in terms of knowledge, knowledge base, commercial interests even, into civilizing them in dealing with this, you won't have the added value of accretion, accretion of, of knowledge. Third, very, very important, make sure that you can disseminate this thing. We're very much in favor of as much open data as possible. Make sure that you have a clearinghouse, which will make sure that developing countries and anyone else will have an equal playing field or level playing field in accessing certain basic data. Norway contributed to that with regard to knowledge about the outer limits of the shelf by working in favor of having developing countries access through different systems as much academic knowledge as possible of the outer limits. Transparency with regard to BBNJ. Transparency is awfully important. Using technology, being open to the combined effect of the entry into play of megatrends, game-changing factors such as quantum uh, computers, big data, use of drones, which will change the deal to, to a large extent. Make sure that that can be put best of use, but make sure that the, the, the knowledge which accrues is not privatized, so that it's only one particular commercial interest somewhere who basically can monopolize the knowledge. I think that's part of the game. But finally, finally, and I'll stop there, the key issue to us is what to do with biodiversity. The main threats are not generated beyond areas of national jurisdiction. The main threats stem from climate change. We have to provide a powerful voice to provide for more effective global climate regulations. Land-based pollution, it's huge. Most of the biodiversity we know of is within economic zones. So I'd like to go back to what we have stated when we have uh, celebrated UNCLOS at different occasions. We've had already had one uh, 30th anniversary, and that was not of the entrance of the force, but of the uh, uh, signing. And uh, at various stages, we've already said that the main concerns we have have to do not with the lack of normative texts, but with the implementation and compliance. And dissemination, and that's where DOALOS and the UN Secretariat are extremely helpful, and I think they can be even helped to be even more helpful in disseminating national practices. Some of the questions I heard this morning concerning what you do in terms of national practices are highly relevant in terms of um, uh, developing practices that influence the understanding of UNCLOS. I have uh, examples about uh, that, I could come back to it. Basically, if we don't attack or undermine the main structure of UNCLOS, preserve its integrity, demonstrate through the powerful words used yesterday by Jonana Guzmao and uh, Chuck Hagel, the combined interest we all have, big or large states, landlocked or fishing or whatever, about the unique standard operating procedure and legitimacy that stems from UNCLOS, then the issue is what kinds of apps and software we need to add to it. Thank you. Right, thank you very much uh, for that. And then I guess we'll move to uh, David. Okay, so I should have my presentation should now be coming up. All right, so thank you very much. Again, let me echo what others have said in uh, thanking uh, our, our hosts, the uh, 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 
Indiana University Law School, the uh, University of Hamburg, and, and IFLOS. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I started off by mocking the uh, jargon which this, uh, uh, this process, this BBNJ process, has I, I tried to get a few more acronyms into that, but the most I could manage was, so area-based management tools, including MPAs under the BBNJ, the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, International Legally Binding Instrument. I could try a few more, but I didn't have any space on the page. So this is part of the whole thing that's become something of an insight. It's been going on for 16 years, nearly, so it's become an inside, uh, uh, very much an insider story. I've got a very large number of slides and I'm going to move through them fairly quickly because um, I wanted to say something a little bit to add to what uh, uh, Ambassador Fife said. I mean, why do we actually need this? And I, I'm the Executive Secretary of the Sargasso Sea Commission, which was set up really to try and explore whether there was a need for this sort of uh, new treaty. And, but I do think it's worth touching base on the, you know, the, the basic issue, which again, Ambassador mentioned, we are looking at really serious impacts now. Existential crisis is a, is a word that's been used, but in terms of our reliance upon the ocean, every second breath that we take is reliant on that. And there's some indications that, 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 the, that, that the biota, which give, give rise to the oxygen that we breathe, is actually uh, being impacted. So we had the census of marine life, which showed huge losses of biodiversity, of, of life forms we didn't even know exist. The World Ocean Assessment, which was mentioned yesterday, and the IPCC, uh, in crisis, uh, ocean and cryosphere change. And IUCN say that without the ocean, the atmosphere would already be 36 degrees centigrade. That's a lot higher than the uh, predicted uh, impacts of dangerous climate change. And we do have this fragmented ocean governance system. So I'll show, say a little bit about that. This is the report. And very unusually, the IPCC uh, report does actually include some governance proposals, which once the scientists start telling us about governance, we ought, probably ought to take this more seriously. Um, it talks about governance relationship uh, arrangements in relation to marine uh, protected areas, spatial plans. They're in many contexts, they say, too fragmented across administrative boundaries and sectors. And they talk about the importance of networks of protected areas to help maintain ecosystem services. So the scientists are telling us, come on, we need to get our act together on this. And that's a, this is a famous slide from the uh, uh, Ocean Commission from some years ago, which actually shows all the bodies which are related to ocean uh, matters. And the point is that all those lines are up and down. There are very few across. I think the result of the BBNJ process is we've that started to change a bit, but still that basically chains of command are up and down. Um, and if you're a planner, this is a, one of my favorite cartoons, I think if you're actually a conservation planner in the high seas, all these even more uh, acronyms to, to, to conjure with. So the Sargasso Sea with Project was started in, in 2010. It's led by the government of Bermuda, and the, it had three main objectives. Uh, achieve international recognition of the importance of the Sargasso Sea, which is a high seas ecosystem. So many people think of the high seas as rather pretty blue areas. This is quite an important, iconic system. And then to work with international and sectoral organizations to achieve better protection, not to make it an MPA, not to make it a no-go area, but to achieve better conservation outcomes in accordance with the convention and to see if this experience is useful for others. And why is the Sargasso Sea important? Uh, this is the area that we have been working in, the western, uh, western basin of the uh, Atlant North Atlantic. It's a gyre. We heard about gyres yesterday. Uh, so it collects plastic, but it also collects sargassum. Um, so the, the uh, clockwise circulation of the system means that the uh, sargassum seaweed, which I've got some pictures of, <coughs> is, is collected within the gyre. And for, for a very long, the exchange rates are very, very, very slow. 50, 60, 70 years. Um, it's also politically important, and I'll say a little bit about the ecological importance in a minute, but the, it's politically important because although it's an area of high seas which is governed by the main sectoral bodies such as the International Maritime Organization and the Seabed Authority, there are no relevant regional organizations. There are, the, if you like, a gap in the regional seas program. If you look there, you can see, I can't use the pointer on this, Slight, and it doesn't work very well. But you can see Bermuda off the, off the coast of, uh, uh, of the North America. 
You see it's the exclusive economic zone there. Uh, and below the 34th parallel, which you can see Ospar area in the northeast Atlantic, there's nothing to the northwest, and there's nothing below that 34th parallel. And that's the same, really, of fisheries management organizations. ICAT, the fisheries, uh, the international... Um, uh, I have to swallow the, the impulse to call it the International Conspiracy to Catch All Tuners, but its, uh, it's the official name is the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuners. That covers the whole of the Atlantic, but there are no actual fisheries, regional fisheries management organizations. You can see NAFO to the northwest and NIAF to the northeast, but nothing below there really down to CIFO in the south. So this is an area which is governed by the sectoral organizations, but no regional ones. It's also a unique, it's a unique high seas system. So these are the mats of Sargassum, which we're talking about. It's a hollow pelagic system, which means that these, these mats, are the, the Sargassum is actually never contacts with, in contact with land. It reproduces at sea. And it's an important, uh, for, very important for biodiversity, important in the life cycle of a large number of important species, some of which are endangered, critically endangered, many of which are threatened. And I mentioned eels, turtles, tunas, billfishes, etc. Uh, these are the two types of fluid of, uh, of, nat of uh, uh, sargassum, a number of endemic species which are associated with it, so high biodiversity actually in the sargassum itself, so they live within the system. Um, and if you float anything in the ocean for long enough, fish come and sit underneath it, and if these are natural organic systems like sargassum, they actually works like a fisheries aggregation device. So if a large number of other uh, fishes that are associated with including very valuable ones like um, what they call Dorado, uh, Mahi Mahi to the, in the American market, um, and Wahoo, as well as tunas. Uh, but it also provides an ecosystem, a little uh, ecosystem which small turtles can actually find uh, a nursery, they can eat it, they actually, the, the system, the water is slightly warmer, and that, this is where their lost years are spent often in the North Atlantic. A um, lot of iconic species, I said billfish, um, a number of uh, whale species that move through it, and, and even the, uh, uh, the iconic bluefin tunas, which, uh, which spawn just north of the, of the Sargasso Sea. So some lovely pictures which my colleagues have taken. Uh, and it's also important, that, uh, uh, not just floating, but it's been there for millions of years, so there is actually a benthic fauna which is associated with this as well. Perhaps the most impressive, if it's not, eels are not particularly iconic to look at, but their life system is amazing. We all know about salmon, that they live their life in, in, fresh, in salt water and then go back to the rivers to spawn, and then their young go back to the same rivers, etc. in the cycle, they're anadromous. Well, eels, the anguillid eels, are catadromous, so they do the opposite. So they live their life in fresh water, and then when they reach maturity, they migrate to 3,000, maybe 4,000 miles from Europe, from the, as far as the Black Sea, from the Baltic, uh, down to an area to the south of Bermuda where they spawn and die. And the little leptocephali, the little, little guys, find their way back, maybe not to the same place their mums and dads came from, I'm not sure who they are. They, they're, uh, they're a different breeding system. Uh, but they, this is a, uh, has been going on for millions of years. We have no idea why, and it's never been witnessed. But the European eel is in critically endangered. It's in something like uh, less than eight, excuse me, eight percent of its uh, of its historical levels, and it's also the subject of a huge and largely illegal trade uh, feeding the sushi industry, not just in in Asia but in Europe and, and the Americas, because. It's very difficult to tell the difference between an American eel and a European eel. They both spawn in this area just south of Bermuda. You see Rostrata is the American eel, Anguilla is the European eel. Anguilla, Anguilla is, is, is CITES, Appendix 2. Um, Rostrata is not even listed on CITES. And so large numbers of Anguilla are being caught in a very small area, and as they return to to the shores, they're being caught, they're being exported through Hong Kong to areas in China where they're being fattened up and then re-exported, often described as Anguilla rostrata. So I can talk about that more if you like, but this, the, as a result of this pressure, this has now become a very critically in, in endangered species. So 2014, uh, we held a meeting in Bermuda, in, in Hamilton, Bermuda, 
uh, of which we got five governments to sign the Hamilton Declaration on I'll give you the full text there, on collaboration for the conservation of the Sargasso Sea. Since then, we've had a number, five more governments. So we've got the Azores, and these were governments advisedly. Bahamas, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Canada, Cayman Islands, Dominican Republic, Monaco, UK, and the United States. We have another, a number of other governments that are very closely associated with what we do, particularly the Netherlands and, and Sweden, and South Africa as well. Um, it's a fairly light and, and mean uh, uh, system. We have meeting of signatories, Sargasso Sea Commission, which is volunteers, so it's not the traditional metal, uh, uh, traditional model, and the Sargasso Sea Secretariat, 50% of which you're seeing standing in front of you. Um, we've done a fairly important uh, summary case uh, on the importance of it, which actually was reviewed by the government of Bermuda and then by the UK, uh, and the line minister is there, which is a very impressive piece of scholarship, a large number of of authors, uh, and we have had, uh, as a result of a proposal by the government of Bermuda, it was declared in 2012 uh, a, an ecologically and biologically significant area. One, at that point, the largest, it's just two million square miles, five million uh, kilometers. As you know, that has no legal significance. So two examples of organizations we've been working with, IMO and, uh, the, and ICAT. Um, so IMO, and the point about, I hear the point of the amazing things that are being done by IMO, but it's very rare that it hasn't actually taken action, uh, or has taken very little action in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, you can see this is a, this is a one month uh, survey from 2012, that map of the, the amount of traffic, you can see it's fairly defined. It has, MIMO has the ability to have spe, uh, MARPOL special areas, it can establish particularly sensitive sea areas, and it can make other ABMTs, uh, area-based management tools. There are only two special areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction, one in the Southern Ocean and one in the Mediterranean, which is kind of cheating because there aren't EZs in the, in the, in the Mediterranean, it's a special case, None are, no others, and there are no PSSAs beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and that's one of the areas of things that we've been looking at. During the time that we've been working, in 10 years, the traffic has increased significantly. This was from Ocean Mind. We, this is the, these are the pictures that uh, Peter didn't show you, but some of them. Um, you can see that in those three years, 2014, 15, 16, the, the traffic is increasing. And this was one month into December of 2018. So there's a huge amount of traffic. This is area between... Uh, in North, the North Atlantic, it's a huge amount of traffic, and it's, there's quite clear evidence it's breaking up the mats, uh, the big sargassum mats. So we're still discussing this. You saw we had th we've got at least four major maritime, major IMO pa uh, powers, I think we can call them, right? We've got the UK, the United States, we've got the Bahamas and Canada. We're still discussing what appropriate measures would be. There is a lot of pushback on having a PSSA in the high seas in such a big area. So a lot of resistance, not IMO itself, but from the participants uh, of precautionary action, and they really want to see evidence of harm, which is an area this big is extremely difficult to show. Similarly with ICAT, we've been working with ICAT for a large number of 10 years. We're going to the meetings there regularly. You can see that's a picture of the fishers, fishery, um, it's quite, it looks like a fish, doesn't it? So the lips are actually the US uh, swordfish fleet. The blue eye is the Bermuda EZ. A little bit of red around the edges of the eyes, which I think are probably IU fishing, which might be misreported, but, uh, and not a lot of fishing uh, to, the, to, the, to the east. And so the argument was made when we first went to, to ICAT with some well, evidence that uh, this was an area which could do with some, not protection necessarily, not closing, but some form of conservation. Uh, a lot of pushback because there are some nations that don't like to see closures of any areas in the high seas or of areas which, or even measures which might look like the beginning of, of protection measures. This is not our agenda. Look, you can see the governments that are associated with what we're doing. Uh, so this is a decision that we took and we actually commissioned all you need to look at the bottom is the column on the right hand side at the bottom where we're showing how little fishing there actually is you can see 1.24 famous blue fins there is 0 0.39 are actually caught in the Sargasso Sea area and so the argument was pushed back to us um, I've got about three or four more slides 
the argument was put back to us, well, why do you need to take any action? There's nothing happening there. Okay, well, the argument that we were putting back is that um, the time to take action, conservation action, is before you have to displace activity. And it's quite clear that there's now been a big increase in, uh, in activity. There's uh, this motion mine again, 2014, 15. You can see this moving in from the east there. And last year, this is the summary of it. And then this was from the beginning of this year, um, where there's quite a lot of activity now. And this is from actually from Global Fishing Watch. Um, we're not saying what nationality those are, but there's a lot of activity now moving in. So now it's going to be much more increasingly difficult to actually take, take measures. So uh, you, th this is Global Fishing Watch suggests that much of this is actually Taiwanese activity. I don't quite even, we don't even sure what they're catching. Um, so what we've tried to do is to use the best science available. I told you about the process that we've used. It's still data poor because we're talking about a huge area. We find it that the ICAC Commission, particularly the distant water nations, have found it literally refused to accept precautionary arguments. The words precautionary principle or approach have been taken out of, de of uh, uh, proposals we've been put in. They diff don't like the, uh, the, the idea of arguments by analogy. Um, so in other areas, this impact has happened, etc. So this would happen here. So you need, in terms of our, our uh, uh, approach, and we're representing, so the uh, commission is represented here by the government of Bermuda, which is overseas territory of the UK. I think we've established some credibility here, but we have to play the game. But the result is we're making some progress now, but it's very taken us 10 years, and it, I think too little, too late. So where's the value for us of the new treaty? Just a couple of provisions, Article 19 on decisions. I could have others as well, but this is, I'm pretty happy with the, with the, air, the ABNT provisions generally. The conference of the parties shall take decisions on matters relating to area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. So they can decide on objectives, and they can look at proposals submitted under this part. You don't need to read any more than that. This is the bit that I think is more important. Whether existing relevant legal instruments or frameworks of relevant global, regional, sectoral bodies, they can decide whether to recommend that state parties' disagreement promote the adoption of the relevant measures. So it's a good process. So the idea is state parties make proposals, and then the, com the, the, com the conference of the parties then decides to tell the members of the agreement, or to decide to, uh, to recommend to the members of the agreement, that they should take measures within, that, within their organization. It's not telling the organization to act, but the state parties, which is a good approach. What happens if they don't? Um, and that's where we come to the next measure, which is whether to adopt measures complementary to those adopted. In other words, my reading of complementary is that it has to be in a first measure before a second one can be in, adopted. So if nothing happens, we still don't have any value added. I can, as a commission, we already can go to IMO, we can already go to ICAT. I'm, I'm, my, my question is whether the, the, this current draft, which is still not final, uh, actually provides us with value added to this. Where there are no relevant existing legal instruments or frameworks or relevant global or regional bodies, the adoption of conservation measures can be taken by the committee. But the IMO and, and, uh, uh, applies everywhere, right? So that's, there always will be some sector bodies. So we're now three quarters of the way through this process. Uh, a lot of process people feel that we need a strong treaty, and I know there's been a lot of support for that within the European Union. And my argument, or our argument, I think, is that the fish stocks agreement, which I was a great supporter of when it was first, it's not been, an, it's not been enough. It's been, it's, it lays down important principles, precautionary principle, ecosystem principle. It has a methodology for the precautionary principle, which is fantastic. But exhortation, once you've done that, then states have to follow it. And they haven't done it with the rigor which many of us think they should have done. So we think that the COP, the Conference of the Parties of the, you know, another acronym, the Conference of the Parties needs to have decision-making powers. It can't take on implementation, clearly. That's got to be done at regional and sectoral level. But there has to be some sort of hierarchical relationship. So if, if actions aren't taken by regional sectoral bodies, then the Conference of the Parties should be take action. It may not need to do it. The fact that it's got the power to do it may mean that that regional sectoral bodies will, will actually act. Um, and these, obviously, those decisions are important because they're of universal application. They're going to apply to all the parties to this 
And we just saw the scientists telling us how important ocean reserves and preserving areas in, in the high seas are going to be for, uh, for our actions on climate change. So thank you for your attention. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you very much uh, for that. And thank you for sensitizing us to the issue of the interaction between RFMOs and um, other innovations like the Commission, uh, which is obviously a, a huge issue. And Ambassador Lee, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Raina, and I'm from Singapore. And first of all, I want to thank um, the organizers of the conference for inviting me to participate. My thanks to the Hamilton Luger School of Indiana University, the Faculty of Law of the University of Hamburg, and the International Foundation for the Law of the Sea. Thank you also to the tribunal for opening up the premises of the tribunal for us to use. Um, before I go any further, just to make clear that I am not speaking today in my capacity as a public servant of Singapore, so nothing I say here today reflects the views of the government of Singapore. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here at this conference to celebrate the 25th birthday of UNCLOS. So, happy birthday, UNCLOS. Um, maybe we should have a cake to celebrate. Um, it's this, this, this um, discussion on um, BBNJ, it's very clear to me um, from the various um, remarks and discussions that have been made both yesterday and this morning um, that many, if not all of you, are familiar and interested um, with in this topic of BBNJ. And one of the great advantages of being the last speaker is that the speakers before me have already covered the topic. And so what's left for me to do is, as the last speaker, is to say, I agree what they said. And then we can take questions. And yeah, and then we can have a discussion. Um, and indeed, the previous speakers have uh, touched on some of the key aspects of the BBNJ negotiations. Um, and as you know, the process, um, it has a very long title, um, and I'm trying to remember it. It's the Intergovernmental Conference on an International Legally Binding Instrument under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea for the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. <sighs> now you know why we just say BBNG. Um, this process of which I have a great privilege of um, uh, participating is aimed at developing a new ILBI um, or agreement and I thought that I would, um, there's so much to cover under BBNJ, but I thought that I would share some of the, some of my thoughts on um, on the process itself and why I have approached uh, the conference the way that I have. Um, but I am happy during the question and answer session to take on board any details that you may want um, to answer any of your questions. Um, but before I go um, into a little bit into what I see the BBNJ agreement can be, um, I, I do want to start by saying a few words about uh, what the BBNJ agreement is not, and the previous speakers have um, in a way spoken about it. The BBNJ agreement is not, and it cannot be a cure-all for all the challenges, all the ills that are facing the ocean today. Yesterday, we heard in the first panel, and we heard throughout the day, what are some of the challenges that are facing the oceans. And I get this, I get people approaching me and asking me, well, can you include this in the agreement, and can you include that in the draft text? 
we can't. We do have to tackle these challenges, but not all the challenges can be tackled within the BBNJ process because we are guided by our mandate. And um, at this point, I want to say the question, is it time for a new treaty? For me, the short answer is yes, because it is my intention to see that we fulfill the mandate that has been given to us by the General Assembly. The BBNJ agreement is also not about a redo. It is not an opportunity to remake UNCLOS or the Part 11 agreement or the Fish Stocks Agreement. It's not about wishing away or ignoring um, bits of the current uh, governance uh, regime that you don't like. Um, it's none of those things. But what the BBNJ can be about, we heard yesterday that the present health of UNCLOS is very good. And the BBNJ agreement can build on the strong foundation um, of UNCLOS. Let's build on, the, on a very healthy UNCLOS, um, the, our constitution, and ensure that it remains in good health for the next 25 years and beyond. And let's work at making the BBNJ agreement an agreement that can bring about the transformative change, the real change that we want to see in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and it has, as um, those of you who have been involved in the process know, it has always been my goal for us to build an effective agreement. And what do we mean by effective agreement? From the beginning of the process, I have always emphasized that it is a member state driven process. Um, why is this important? And it is important because states are the drivers of change. States are the ones that are going to implement whatever measures we undertake. So it's very important for states to have a sense of ownership of the process for them to shape the agreement um, so that hopefully when the time is right, uh, the states will be prepared to ratify this agreement because one plank of an effective agreement, uh, particularly an agreement for areas beyond national jurisdiction, is universal participation. The high seas and the area are areas that belong to nobody and to everybody. And so it's very important that we get as many people on board as possible. And one of the ways that I strive to do that is by emphasizing the member state driven approach. But universality alone cannot ensure an effective agreement. And the second main plank of an effective agreement is a focus on shaping what I call an implementable agreement. Um, an, an agreement where we not only know what we want to do, but we know who is supposed to do what. And at this point in time, because I've said this many times before, my apologies to those of you who have heard me say this many times um, before, within the process, um, I have urged, or maybe the word to use is I've nagged delegations into focusing on the people and the processes. How do we do what we say we want to do and who's going to do them um, and who the actors are? So taking the issue of the actors um, first, we know that there are many players in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. You saw that chart um, that, that, that David um, put up of all the different players. Um, and yesterday we heard um, discussions about how important it is to bring on board or to include all the stakeholders, the stakeholders that in our discussions during the process include not just the international organizations, but also the private sector, um, the coastal states, um, civil society, uh, relevant organizations, all these stakeholders, it's important to bring them together, but also have a sense of who is supposed to do what. So we do need to pay some attention um, to that. 
And that takes us to the question of, well, what are each of these actors supposed to do? Um, and, and this is where I, I ask delegations to um, place a focus on the mechanisms, the processes, the institutions that we want to build um, um, in this agreement. And why is this important? Um, to me, I think that one of the beauties of UNCLOS is that it works. Um, maybe not perfectly, uh, but it works. I mean, if we think about if we think about the 1970s, which was when the third UNCLOS um, was negotiated, the world was a very different one. I have people who come up to me and who say, actually, you know, in the third conference, they did this. Shouldn't we do this? And I tell them that the third conference, the processes for the third conference were very different. For a start, they used to meet 10 weeks at a time, um, which I don't think can happen today. They lived in a world with no laptops, no, which I know is very alien to the very young ones here. No laptops, everybody worked on paper and pen, there were no cell phones, there were no emails. Um, it's a very different world. And UNCLOS was constructed in a very different um, world, um, and how we used the oceans back then was also very different. But despite um, despite uh, uh, the changes that the past 30 or so years have seen, UNCLOS still works. Um, it has been, as uh, Alexander had mentioned in his opening, flexible enough to, to, um, to accommodate um, the changes that we see. And um, my view is that we should strive to do the same for the BBNJ agreement. And that is why I think we should focus on the mechanisms, the processes, the, um, the, the, the institutions that we want to build. Now, yesterday, um, Andrew Friedman, in his presentation, talked about the importance of the science policy interface. And I think that many of you will be happy to know that in the um, process, many delegations agree on the importance of a science-based approach, the need to use the best available scientific evidence, information, uh, and knowledge. Um, as well as traditional knowledge, which is gaining a lot of support as well. But uh, it is very important for us to remember that the BBNJ agreement cannot be built on current science. It cannot be designed on the basis of what we know today about the areas beyond national jurisdiction. We have to develop processes and mechanisms, bodies and institutions that can take on board this new information that we will have, this new science that we will learn over the next few decades and work with it and develop measures and solutions that will bring about real change. And we will have an increase in our knowledge. Um, um, there will, we will know more about the areas beyond national jurisdiction, um, particularly with the upcoming decade of ocean science, which um, Peter Horn uh, referred to. And that's where I think the agreement can make a real uh, difference that may require us, well, not us, me, I don't make the decisions, it's the member states that will make the decisions, that might require us to be a little bit more creative in terms of how we design some of these processes, some of these mechanisms, some of these institutions, um, and that's where we are um, heading to. You know, one of the hallmarks of the BBNJ process, those of you who are involved in the process, Process. One of the hallmarks of the process is that the delegations are very highly engaged, highly motivated, very active um, participants in the process. And I have um, with me Gabby, who is the secretary of the conference, and I think she will agree with me that our delegations are very active. And with such a high level of commitment from so many delegations, I have no doubt that we will eventually reach a successful outcome. 
Yesterday, David Freestone said that the BBNJ process is an opportunity of a lifetime. And I agree, the opportunity to develop a new agreement that can bring about real change in how we conserve and sustainably use the marine biodiversity in the areas beyond national jurisdiction are not opportunities that come around every day. Those of you who are veterans in the process, including Judge Haider, will know it's taken us about 15 years to get to this point. And it is incumbent on all of us not to squander this opportunity, but to take full advantage of it. And now I'm very happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much. That um, superb presentation, and I think we're going to have quite a number of questions, but um, I might, in the interest of kind of making sure that people understand the dynamics, I wonder if I could take the liberty of asking uh, an initial question, and this would go to everyone, I think, which is, what are the fault lines in the negotiations? I know, I know Ambassador Lee, that you're probably dispositionally disinclined to discuss this, so maybe we can have others, but, but I think people need to have a better sense of where the fault lines are. Um, and so I'd be really interested to hear that as a kind of a preface to the broader discussion we can have. Sure, yeah. Yeah, happy to, happy to start. It's better if Rena doesn't say that, I think. <laughs> um, Actually, I think, I mean, I'm, I zeroed in on this, uh, I'm you know, one of three members of the panel, so I zeroed in on the issue that I was particularly interested in, which is the area-based management tools. But the, uh, of, the, of the three issues, uh, three substantive issues, and then so they're, remember, MGRs, uh, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, uh, then the third one is environmental impact assessment, which I, sorry? Yeah, that's the fourth one, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so Rena's reminding me. There's the fourth. Is, uh, I, let me just finish. So, th th uh, air, uh, air, um, uh, <laughs> completely thrown. So, environmental impact. So, when the president tells you, <laughs> reminds you, kind of throws you off a bit. So, MGRs, ABMTs, uh, EIAs. EIAs really are the point I was going to make. The EIAs actually really are an MBMT in some. some Thoughts. And then, of course, capacity building and technology transfer, which is really important. Um, and I think that actually of those three, and I've been following this fairly closely, I wasn't able to go to the IGC3, but I read the reports uh, avidly, MGRs are the key problem area, I think, still. And I thought that what Ambassador Fife said was really right in that there's been, a, in a sense, this undue expectation of what this is going to, about and what it's likely to deliver. Um, in a sense, there's an analogy with seabed mining. I think in the 1970s, a uh, large number of, th of countries thought they were going to, there's millions to be made out of manganese nodules. All right, so we're a long way further now. We're 50 years on, and that none of them have been brought to the surface in marketable quantities. And certainly, the fund for future generations and for developing countries has not even been established yet. And I'm worried that MGRs has seen other manganese nodules of, of the next generation, that there's undue expectation of what might be delivered by MGRs. It's obviously important. There have already been. The, uh, there's already a lot of scientific discoveries which have been useful, but n not huge money-making ventures. So I think, again, I agree with the point. With We need to take this. This needs to be dealt with, but it needs to be dealt with in a proportionate manner. So MGRs are the issues. The others, I think, I mean, there will be good d disputes about financing and capacity building, etc., which is very important. That, that ties well in with the, with the um, decade of ocean science, which is just starting. Uh, EIA seems to be fairly straightforward. ABI, I've got some quibbles about ABMTs, but I think we're sort of there nearly. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's, that's the full name. <coughs> I'll be brief. I agree with David. I think this issue has, uh, it comes from a place where you had a huge potential for ideological uh, renaissance for all the old symbolic causes, mm. whether they had to do with um, protecting common heritage of mankind or accessing something 
no one really understood a resource which was difficult to, to grasp, plus dissatisfaction even with UNCLOS. All of those were co converging into this big marketplace of ideas. And I think the way it's been structured the process, it has uh, comforted us in Norway in the sense that it is clear that this will not undermine the existing systems. Rather, we will try to strengthen them and then we will supplement them where needed. And the value-added approach is extremely important. Now, we need also humility with regard to certain expectations. And that's, uh, uh, as I, I think I understand you, as, as an issue of management of expectations being very important. On the Norwegian side, we worry about one particular issue, and that is biodiversity within the national jurisdiction, where you have a lot of biodiversity which is currently being threatened. And uh, we also have a keen um, feeling that uh, adopting treaties is not necessarily the only answer to uh, the current problems. You have other legal orders, you have domestic legal orders, and the way states actually implement, they prioritize, the resources they put into play in controlling, monitoring, compliance, are absolutely essential also for the biodiversity down the road beyond national jurisdiction. So we'd rather not have the temptation of complacency uh, I'm pretty sure that we will be successful at some point under your leadership, Ambassador um, Lee. Um, we will have uh, an international legally binding instrument, but hopefully that will not become a resting pillow in the sense of saying, okay, we have saved the planet, because uh, there are lots of other things that need to be done too. And thank you. So, David, the first thing that um, you should know is that my name is just Reina. Everybody knows this in the process. My name is just Reina. I mean, I think that there have been reams written about the fault lines in the process. Um, um, I was my, when you first asked the question, my initial thought was, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, because we could discuss this could be the subject of a discussion for the whole day. But I think that both um, both David and Rolf have um, actually brought out some of the key uh, fault lines, and I know that many people here are very familiar with them as well. So I mean, I'd be happy to take other questions. Thank you. Yes, let's please go to uh, questions that are out there and uh, maybe we, let's take a first round here uh, with Garth and then uh, Judge Haidar. And then we'll include Judge Haidar's question. Was I heard before? Or? Yes. I think okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so basically, uh, so irrespective of what view you take on what would be the applicable legal framework for MTRs, the the fact remains that those resources are not addressed per se, and for the for the obvious reason that generally, 
The negotiators did not know about these resources when the convention was drafted. Um, so that needs to be addressed, and uh, I'm not going to go into any details about how that should be done. It has to be done, I think, in a manner that attracts the acceptance as, of as many countries as possible on, with, with the different views. Uh, the other uh, gap, I think, is with, with uh, um, MPAs, marine protected areas, but only, only some MPAs. So I would distinguish between fisheries-related MPAs on the one hand and then other MPAs on the other. Now, if you look at UNCLOS and the Fish Stocks Agreement in combination, I would argue that, you could well argue that there is, a, there is already a mandate for RFMOs not only to uh, decide on total allowable cats, allocate quotas, but also to establish fisheries-related MPAs. They can be really, they are really part of fisheries management. They can be to protect juveniles, they can be to protect uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems from bottom fisheries, for example, and this has been done, for example, in the Northeast Atlantic, not maybe in all areas equally. But then, um, so I would argue that there is no legal gap here. No, I mean, generally speaking, at least with respect to startling stocks and highly migratory fish stocks. Uh, but then you have the other MPAs, and if you look at OSPAR in the Northeast Atlantic, so NIAF is the, the fisheries organization, OSPAR is the environment organization, and I think all the members of OSPAR would agree that their MPAs do not bind any non-member. Uh, it's, it's different from NIAF. I, I would argue that if, if any uh, actor starts fishing uh, within an MPA uh, established by, by NIAF, uh, that would be illegal fishing. I mean, that, that, that would be the consequence. But in OSPAR, I think the members do agree that uh, the, the MPAs are not binding on non-members of OSPAR because OSPAR does not have this mandate that the, the RFMOs have in the Fish Stocks Agreement. So I think you could argue that the, the new agreement on BPNJ, it should, give, it, it should either give these uh, regional environmental organizations like OSPAR a comparable mandate as, as the RFMOs have to Established MPAs with binding effect, not only on the members of OSPAR, but also on all the state's parties to this new BBNJ agreement. Or alternatively, there will be a global mechanism, the conference of the parties, that would take decisions on these non-fisheries MPAs. So I think there are various options. And all that being said, I think there could be a usefulness in having a conference of the parties with some overview role even with respect to some of the RFMOs, so that would be kind of a softer approach. So I think that, that would be a very useful thing anyway, but without perhaps decision-making powers in the realm of, of fisheries. Thank you. So those are great questions. And just to um, recap, so the, from Garth was the question about what is the interaction between uh, BBNJ and fisheries? Um, and then from Judge Haidar, what are the legal gaps uh, MGRs, clearly non-fisheries MPAs, are these being addressed adequately by the text that we're seeing? And then I would just tag on, if I could, and, and Judge Heider alluded to this as well, to what extent can we really use BBNJ to address the very variable performance of our FMOs? Um, and you, you hinted at this, David, a little bit in your um, presentation, but maybe we could go down, down the row on these questions on the table. Yeah, I, I think on our side, based on not my current work, but previous experience, we see both an issue of efficiency. How do you utilize to the maximum through transparency and through interaction between bodies that already have competencies? established competencies, constituencies around them, systems which are related to profit making and science, how can you mobilize them and make them responsible? If you basically are perceived by them or the actors behind them as being um, threatening their existence, they will react negatively. So we would ri rather like to see a yin and yang situation of uh, combining efforts 
and uh, we need much more transparency, much more accountability. Um, but who better than uh, RFMOs to actually um, make sure that one implements certain measures? That's one question. The other is a more ideological thing, possibly. Um, you know, the, the notion of sustainable development, meaning that you should include people and economies in a shared understanding of um, the major existential issues related to biodiversity and, um, and other things, stems largely from um, work carried out uh, on the aegis of uh, former Prime Minister Brundtland, the Brundtland Commission, 1987, the Common, uh, Common Future Report, and then uh, basically the work that led to the 1992 Rio Conference, where the idea was that uh, you must try to include the key uh, human and societal um, circuits and networks of um, uh, economically relevant uh, nature into this thinking, Otherwise, you will not get anywhere. Um, preparing for this uh, conference, I actually uh, went back to the 1987 report uh, of the Brundtland Commission. I recognized about 60% uh, of all the issues that were remain mentioned in the course of those two days. They were already on the table then. There was all already a question of division of competencies, of uh, uh, fragmentation, of dangers of uh, not uh, uh, actually uh, appearing to do things but uh, the time factor, uh, whether you relate to classic international law and treaty making, uh, the processes require a certain degree of length uh, because you have to anchor them in parliamentary approval processes even after you have signed and uh, before you can ratify. While the time factor relating to the urgency of some of those environmental matters, all of that is already described there. And I'm, I tend to, to think that in this context, you must mobilize uh, all relevant actors, you must make sure that you lose money if you behave improperly, that you can gain money, and if you are in research, in technological innovation and the like, there are loads of money to be uh, won in order to make sure that the oceans uh, have a renaissance because they are going to become the key factor for uh, basically uh, food supplies and a number of other things in the future. So I think that uh, this discussion would be served by trying to include in more transparent and in better coordinated ways common understandings of, of the challenges and then hold people and states accountable. Um, and you can impose lots of conditions on fishermen and uh, we certainly uh, do in our uh, own waters. Just to mention an example, we have been for about 20 years uh, advocating as crusaders the principle of total prohibition against fish discards, meaning that any fish, whether it's, fish, it's a juvenile fish caught by mistake or what, what have you, that is brought on board the vessel shall never be thrown back to the sea. It has to be counted in because then you get a valid assessment of the actual catches, the actual takeout, and you can build resource management around that. While the tradition has been in many places to measure catches in port when you land them. And in between, you may have had losses which vary between 20 and 60% and the mortality rate of the discarded fish. Okay, that is something which excites passions in Norway along our coasts because population is believes this is a make it or break it in terms of credibility in resource management. Now, has, has our crusading in favor of this led to a, a sea change globally? Not yet. But we haven't given up hope that more more states, the European Union has been working actively on this account and others will join in on that point. It's highly concrete and one should actually expose those who say otherwise. Sorry for being very blunt. Thank you. Well, I, I like what you said, so I'm certainly happy, happy to follow on from that. Yeah, I, I think any agreement, just Garth's question first, I mean, any agreement which relates to biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, which doesn't include fish, is, would be ridiculous. Uh, so I think the, the, the current approach is that the fish is a commodity as opposed to a marine genetic resource, there's a distinction, and that's the way things to be going uh, in, in some case. 
So that so it's it's on the uh, on the table. There's been some recent research by Duke University which suggests that I can't remember the exact figure, but it's 4.8 percent of fish in the sea are actually target species for consumption. So fish, and that's the point you make, that the human activities have a lot of impact on fish, which are not the ones that we eat. So that's, and that's an important part of the ecosystem approach. Um, it is, so we're 25 years since the coming to, into force of the Law of the Sea Convention, and we're 24 years since the signing of the Fish Docks Agreement. I agree entirely with uh, Judge Hyder, what he says about about um, uh, fisheries actions by uh, by fisheries bodies in closing off areas. Uh, I think that's a good interpretation of the fish stocks agreement. But in other respects, it's not been that successful. If, all, if the rest of the world, if all the other fisheries organisations were as good as NIAF or even NAFO, I think we would, we would not be. You know, we'd be in much better shape. Um, the work, um, uh, as I was suggesting, the work that we've been doing with, with ICAT, for example, on ecosystem-based approach to fisheries, we're the only ones actually doing work with ICAT. And this is one of the mandates of the 95 Agreement. So I, think, I do think that there is a, a strong case for including um, uh, fisheries bodies, that's my personal view anyway, within the ambit of this, because it's part of the impacts, human impacts on the ocean. If I, I hear what you're saying about legal gaps and other gaps, but uh, I mean, Article 197, remember, says that, that states co shall collaborate through international and regional bodies to, uh, uh, for environmental uh, conservation purposes. So that, that, that's, that, that's already there. So there isn't even a gap of that kind. So I think we're, we're as much concerned, and I think the negotiations is an issue for the negotiators, but we're much concerned with implementation gaps as well. And that, that is clearly one which I think could be addressed by this. I, I suspect you disagree, but we can do that on the best of terms. <laughs> um, thank you for the questions. I think, first of all, the question about the interface between BBNJ and fisheries, I think, as um, David has said, I the approach seems to be to exclude the, um, the application of the, the agreement uh, to fish um, that are being handled as a commodity. Now, what that exactly means uh, uh, needs to be fleshed out. There was a proposal on, in terms of uh, specifying tonnage, but I think that proposal has um, fallen off the table. Uh, we, uh, we seem to be approaching on just the basis of fish as a commodity being um, excluded from the scope of the agreement. Uh, in terms of Judge Haider's um, question and his experience in this process is much longer than mine. So I, um, it's true that it's important um, that one of the key legal gaps is the, um, is the treatment of um, marine genetic resources. And I think um, uh, it is important that we try to attract the acceptance of as many um, um, states as possible in terms of how we will regulate, if at all, uh, the utilization of marine genetic resources and how the benefits um, will be shared. Uh, I think there seems to be some movement towards, um, towards an agreement to have a COP. Uh, I think where the discussion needs to take place is exactly what will the COP do? What will be the powers, the functions of the COP? And this is where we might need a little bit of credibility. Many of us have probably attended a um, conference of the parties in some other respects. So we have in mind a particular mindset of what a COP is like. But maybe we need to uh, re-examine that mindset and ask ourselves what can a COP under this agreement that needs to coordinate with other existing bodies, with other stakeholders can look like. And I think that one of the, we're, we're focused a lot, um, and this is not to say that my view is shared by many delegations or I'm just expressing my, I guess, personal view in that sense and no intention of imposing this on anyone. Um, I think that there's been a lot of um, focus in terms of the interaction between the current existing uh, governance regime because it is part of our mandate that we cannot undermine existing um, frameworks, bodies, instruments. It's a very long sentence, but 
something along those lines, no undermining um, the existing um, framework. That's true, and so a lot of the discussion has been surrounding how this new instrument is going to interact with or find its place or its position in the um, governance architecture of the oceans. But one of the things that I think maybe we also need to look at is how within, um, within national delegations, within states, um, these coordinations are taking place. Because there's a, maybe a kind of a, a disconnect uh, in, in um, national jurisdictions as well. And what I mean by this is we know that some of the relevant um, organizations, IMO, FAO, um, the RFMOs, um, CBD, and if you were to, I think that if we were to look at the participation, the delegation members of, just pick a few main delegations, you will see that different people are attending different meetings. So there is um, something to be said for having coordination at the national level as well, so that we can take, um, so that we can take a concerted action at all the different forums, and that would be very helpful. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are very familiar with the synergies process. The synergies process is a process that uh, applies to the chemicals convention, the Basel convention, the Stockholm convention, the Rotterdam conventions, and these um, uh, environmental uh, conventions, they have, uh, they have um, what they call an ex-COP, an extraordinary COP where the three conventions come together. I think they're going to include the Minamata Convention on Mercury as well. Now, they do place a lot of emphasis on capacity building, and one of the key um, prongs of their capacity building program is coordination at the national level to enable effective use of national resources to take coordinated actions across the different conventions. And that's something that we might want to give a little bit of thought to. Thank you. We have hit our mark, um, which is 12.30. Um, and lunch awaits. Now, if I could, I'm going to make a, a brief programming uh, announcement, which is in our uh, sketching out the program, we had originally visioned, envisioned doing lunch and then trying to drag you back here for closing remarks. We realized the insanity of that. Um, and so if you'll indulge us, uh, what I'm going to do after I ask you to thank our wonderful panel is uh, to hear just a few remarks that I'll give uh, mainly in the vein of thank yous. Um, and, uh, and then we'll adjourn for lunch where we can truly uh, relax without having to uh, be shepherded back. Um, but before we do any of that, I would be so grateful if you could uh, thank the, the superb panel for their contributions. Places. Um, so we've had another uh, superb uh, day here, really uh, good discussions, great questions. I'd like to uh, take a moment just to thank uh, the court, to thank uh, President Paik for welcoming us so graciously, for being such an active participant. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Hamburg um, and Alexander Prels, obviously, uh, uh, playing such a wonderful uh, co-organizing role, uh, the dean of uh, the Hamilton Luger School, uh, Lee Feinstein. Um, we had a superb array of keynote speakers. Uh, President Paik obviously got us off uh, on a wonderful uh, note, and then President Guzmao, uh, very powerful presentation, Secretary Hagel. Um, I don't think we could have done any better in terms of uh, keynote speakers for this conference. I want to take a moment, um, when we talk about the international seabed, we talk about the area. Um, I'd like to talk about the team, um, which is the, the people who really made this uh, happen. Um, Rachel uh, Cusera, is she 
She's probably organizing lunch. Um, but uh, she has just been absolutely superb. Uh, not in absentia, I'd like to recognize Emily Stern uh, from the Hamilton Luger School, um, who did so much of the legwork in the early stages. Uh, from Hamburg, I suspect she's also organizing uh, right now, but Deborah Carter, uh, Debbie, has just been uh, wonderful. Um, there's a group that kind of was the early brain trust for this conference that I want to uh, mention. Um, Harold Coe uh, was, was really wonderful in thinking about who should be involved. Uh, Mac Bernstein, uh, Jessica Woolley, thank you so much uh, for, for helping us in shaping this conference. If you'll indulge me, I'd just like to make a very few uh, substantive comments. The first would be that I think one thing this conference has done, and I don't think those of us who work in the international law, global governance space do this enough, is to recognize just how much we've achieved. I think often we are so enmeshed in the dysfunctionalities, in the gaps, um, that we lose, and I do this myself with my students when I'm teaching these things, but we lose sight of what's been achieved. And I think this conference, and President Paik really started us off, I think in a wonderful way to, to understand how much has been achieved uh, in the 25 years since uh, UNCLOS came into to, uh, effect. Uh, we have a functioning ITLOS that has done some very important things. We have a broader jurisprudence, I thought Harold Coe, started us off by reminding us of how much jurisprudence there's been, how effective it's been, and how it's done some very, very hard things quite recently, including taking on great powers, ruling against them. This is stuff that in many areas of international law simply hasn't been done yet, or has been done only very episodically. Um, and the unclosed dispute resolution system is doing it. And so I think if, if nothing else, We've had at this conference a moment to say, look at what we've achieved. Um, and to be, I think, uh, revived, I hope, by that. Of course, we saw the challenges. Uh, we saw the gaps. Uh, I still think about Berenice's uh, presentation and talking about uh, migration on the Mediterranean, the deadly gaps uh, that exist. We saw with Maria's presentation the offshore energy uh, situation and how we, we have to refine, reinterpret the tools to deal with many of the new innovations that are, that are out there. So there's obviously a process of updating, of adapting, of interpreting that has to go on. But it has to go on while we think about the durability and the carrying capacity of these institutions. Um, and I think that was a point that, that came up at a, at a couple different points. How much can the institutions bear? Um, that is a hard question, I think, in the best of times. Um, but it is a particularly hard question and hard task now. Uh, and here I'm thinking about Secretary Hagel's keynote, which really, I think, clarified um, how challenging the moment is, of course, not just for UNCLOS, but for all global institutions. Um, and to do the amount of work that we have to do to keep the unclosed system updated, to get BBNJ, to do all of that while this storm of populism and anti-globalism, anti-institutionalism is raging, is a tall order. It's a tall order. Um, and yet, I think we had some important hints in this conference of how we get the energy we need to take that on. Um, there was a mention early on of hope, and I think President Guzmán um, brought us back to that concept of hope. And I think one thing that can kind of provide us some of this energy is an understanding of what we've achieved, but also an understanding of the human benefits that have emerged from what we've achieved. And the Timor example, I think, throughout this conference has served as a reminder that when we achieve things through UNCLOS, we achieve things that matter to real people. We achieve things that matter to states, that matter to young states. Um, and so I think we can take energy from that as we go about our work as professors trying to convince students that this matters, 
as governments trying to convince other organizations, other constituencies within government that you need to pay attention to this, even though it's technical, even though it's complicated. For NGOs, how we convince the broader public that what we're working on matters. I think we can take from the very real human benefits of what we've achieved some of that energy. And finally, I think we can take energy from the connections that we're developing here. Um, and so we're, we're obviously not alone. We, we can draw on each other's strength. I think one of the most wonderful things about this conference is the fact that Ambassador Lee, who was this kind of mythical figure for me, is now just Rena. Um, and there are, of course, dozens of other connections like that that have been formed uh, throughout this conference. So I want to thank uh, each and every participant for uh, what has really been wonderful. Um, I hope we can, there will be other initiatives, collaborations, formal, informal, that may emerge from this. Um, I wish you the very best uh, for your upcoming travels, and I look forward to uh, staying in touch with uh, many of you going forward. Thank you again.